Hello viewers, will you join me in Oregon, in Salem, Oregon, where I am thrilled to be visiting my good friend and mentor, John Hoyle. Thanks for having me here, John. You're welcome. <laughs> so happy to have you. And uh, what can I say about John? Well, as I say, he's my mentor. He is somebody who, when I was first getting started with activism, he was the one who reached out to me and basically said, um, how can I help you with your plans for a survey? And that's how, how JW Survey came to be, basically, wasn't it? So what can I say? John, you've always been there and you've always been there for advice. You've been there for help, for technical help. And uh, this is actually only the second time that we met in the flesh, it's isn't person, it? Right. Because of the huge distances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say it's a, it's a little ways. Yeah, so I was quite keen to to document this and get you on camera and and just basically have a conversation. I'm so, okay. um, let's let's go back. Let's rewind. Um, how did you come to be involved with Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, in 1951. Dick Kelly's parents basically converted my family to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, I went along with it. I was I loved to read, and I was actively involved in the Bible study that my mother had with the, one of the sisters. And I liked going out door to door and standing on street corners and doing all that. I really enjoyed it, and so I really got into it and stayed into it till my late teens when I finally began to rethink my involvement to a degree in. But uh, no, I was very active. I vibe vacation pioneered, gave my first public talk when I was 15, uh, Theocratic Ministry School. I was I was a A1 Jehovah's Witness until my late teens. And you say that you know you you decided that it wasn't for you. What what kind of brought you onto that way of thinking? Well, it, it, there's several reasons, but mm. one of the reasons was I started reading the scripture quotes or the scripture references in the watchtower and in the books that were used usually at the end of a paragraph that it was supposed to support the paragraph. And I would be, get bored during the meeting and I would go look up all the scriptures and read, it, read them in context and found out that mo so many times when you read them in context, they really have nothing to do with the subject of the article. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me. That really mm -hmm. bothered me. So that's one of the things that got me started. And it was just... A lot of the social backbiting and stuff within the congregation that I just felt uh, wouldn't have been appropriate or allowed by an you know, organization if it was truly Jehovah's organization. It just yeah. didn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to because you have certain expectations of what the truth should be. And, uh, you know, this wonderful spiritual paradise. But when it all boils down to it, you know, people are human and, and humans, you know, do gossip and talk about each other and backbite, as you put it. Uh, I will say this for that time period was it was a lot more of a family, true family situation between the brothers and sisters. The congregations uh, were larger mm -hmm. and it was a, a broader base of, of teenagers and young people and and all types, so it it was seemed like more of a family than than what I've seen in recent years or what I experienced toward the end of my relationship. Mm. So, talk us through. I mean, you have just to kind of explain why I'm asking this. I've I've come into activism fairly recently, mm -hmm. and when I say fairly recently, it was 2011, October 2011, that we launched JW Survey, and that's essentially when my activism began. Mm -hmm. Um, you've been going much longer than that. <laughs> a bit longer. Yeah. I, I think it's safe to say you're pretty much retired now. You've you kind of right. you've been involved. You've done your bit, and you're taking a well earned break. But you know, talk us. Try to give us some impression of what what it was like in the early days of activism, and and what kind of how what it was like to to be involved in that regard. Well, early on, I didn't realize even at that stage and we're talking about 2006 or so when I really kind of got into it right um, there wasn't a lot I know there was a couple of 
of uh, bulletin boards and a couple of discussion boards going, but they were real small and not well publicized. Right. And what really brought me in is something completely off of, offline, and that was a close friend of mine, childhood friend of mine, whose parents brought my ch my fam family into the Jehovah's Witnesses, Dick Kelly, Richard Kelly. I happened to see his name pop up on the internet that he was writing a book. And I, I was able to get con in contact with him by email. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was he had thought about getting in contact with me about that same time, but he didn't know how. So we connected and when I actually read his book, his first book, that was what really made me think, hey, there's a possibility of, of making a difference in this thing. So I just kind of threw my support to Dick by make, setting up a website for him and doing some of that. But, but then as I got in and into it, I realized there's all these meetups groups. There's a, there were a lot of people that had gone on for a long time. And then I would hit on an, an occasional discussion group that kept my interest. And I would... I, I said, said to myself, you've been doubting this this whole thing for 30 or 40 years, and now all of a sudden your doubts are, are being cataloged and explained. Ah, oh, that's like, interesting. Yeah. So you you kind of got out as a teenager, right. and please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but for 30 or 40 years, you just, you just had a hunch that it wasn't true. You didn't necessarily have all of the research... I, I took a stand when I was about 20 years old mm. that eventually got me disfellowshipped. But I was still married to a, a Jehovah's Witness lady. Right. And she was raising my kids as Jehovah's Witnesses. And I let her be. I just stayed off. And every so often I'd go to the Kingdom Hall just to accompany her, especially if it was right. bad weather or something. Uh, but then what really triggered it was the, the 1975 thing. But I won't get too deep into that but yeah when it that really began to affect my family relationship mm. and that's when I really started to be antagonized mm. by what the witnesses were doing before that I could just ignore them and move on but at that point when it started messing with my family that's when I really had to started to get interested in it. but then I didn't really do much to it until I again until I met up with Dick Kelly in the early 2000s that's interesting so yeah, I mean, Richard, Richard is a mutual friend, and um, he, I, I describe a little bit about his story in my book as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, so two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, um, you start kind of making forays on online and, right. and on on forums. Um, what a lot of viewers won't realise is that many, a, a, a good chunk of, of XJW websites you know, have, have you right. in, in kind of instrumental in their setup? So what websites have you been involved with? And well, directly <clears throat> was, I started off with, with a website called Just One Opinion, which was a newsy website, but it would talk about religion in mm -hmm. kind of offhanded uh, ways. And then I created XJW.com. Yeah, yeah. And that was a real start. And I, was, I wasn't expecting anything from it. In fact, it was a couple, three different versions before it really got it on. I got it on WordPress, and I kind of formatted it, and everybody kind of wrote in and said, what, how long have you been doing this? And I'd say, well, a couple, three months. And they'd say, well, you got to keep doing it, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So what happened was I was shocked by the early success of XJW.com. Yeah. And then... I connected with Dick Kelly, and Dick Kelly said, can you do a website for me? So I did a richardkelly.com, and I did his, and, and then after that, I started to get a little interest in whatever. I, and I did a couple of other websites as well that were on the JW. You did Inside the Watchtower. Inside the Watchtower, and uh, Watchtower Watch. Yeah. Um, and then occasionally I would do one for, for someone else, and most of those dropped by the wayside, because... They were all excited at first, and then mm. they didn't know what to say after it was, the website was up. So, mm. um, so most of those older sites are down. Mm. But um, no, I just kind of helped a few people along the way. Offered my help to a few people who were, in some cases, myself included. Yourself included. <laughs> uh, it worked. And in some cases, it didn't. Um, yeah. 
So I, I don't try to, the, the one thing that I don't, won't do is I won't do a, a heavy handed XJW website. Mm -hmm. Someone that just is completely out of the realm of, of uh, sanity, so to speak. And there were a ton of those that mm -hmm. I found. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that I would not, I would actually take websites down that I had started when suddenly people became foul-mouthed or um, were clearly telling lies on the mm -hmm. website. I wrote, I wrote right back and say, you know that's not true. And they'd say, but it's my website. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, I'm not going to be your webmaster. So yeah. I had to take a stand a few times. So I've got a, I got a few people that don't like me that well out there. Right. But, but on the other hand, I, I work with uh, people like yourself who you expressed at the time that you really didn't know anything about websites, but could I help you do it? And we worked together, and you learned so quickly that that I didn't have to do much after it was set up. It was maybe I, my day to day involvement maybe lasted six months, and mm -hmm. then you took off with it. Mm -hmm. So um, you're you're one of those websites that I can I can be very proud of, and for getting it started, letting the match, if nothing else. Thank you. We do still have catastrophes from time to time, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll, I'll reach out to you, but we also have John Redwood as well. He'll sometimes right. He's good. leap to the rescue, right. yeah. Um, so xjw.com, um, I just want to kind of know what your thoughts, what your plans are for it, because obviously you're not involved in activism now. It, do you plan to make continue to make that available as a resource? Because there's obviously some inf interesting information on there. When when I when everything sorts out, mm. uh, there's going to be a couple of websites that are not mine that I support as uh, editor and as webmaster. Mm. My own, I'm probably going to narrow it down to three. Mm. XJW.com, perhaps inside the Watchtower, mm. I'm, I'm flirting with that one, and Watchtower Watch. Then there was, there's one new one that I've got on the side, I just haven't had time to work with it, which is more like a compilation website that draws the best from all the other websites and basically just highlights them and points to them. Right. So it's going to act as kind of a go here first to see what's going on in the rest of the XJW world, right. rather than doing a lot of uh, new stuff. Mm. So I think if I can do that, where I kind of, they know that, oh, let's go see what John's recommending this week. Mm. Uh, I think that, that has a ability to take up, and plus it doesn't require my yeah. uh, involvement with a lot of writing. It can't need day-to-day -day involvement, right. otherwise you're not retired, are you? <laughs> I am not, and well, my wife starts wondering about three o'clock in the morning if I'm ever going to finish that the project I'm on. Yeah. But right now, uh, I'd have to say that my my focus has is recently in the last year and a half since the first Australian uh, Commission hearings is pretty much just be uh, the catcher to Barbara Anderson's pitching. Mm. Uh, she, she's so you're time. working closely with Barbara, aren't you? With, right. with um, Watchtower, Watchtower Documents, Documents. Right. yeah. Dot org, right? Yeah, and that and that one is that that probably takes thirty percent of my time, and the rest of the time is spread between my own stuff and other stuff. Mm -hmm. But but I feel that Barbara's website has the value and is, is unique enough, uh, and with her credibility, yeah, it, it, that one is be supported. It's an important website. In fact, that website was, it didn't, I, I can't credit it as, um, it, it was, it did help me, right. but with, with my wife, with Diana, that was the website right. because she read Barbara's story and for the first time it clicked mm -hmm. as to child abuse. So the work Barbara's done. Uh, yeah. it's, it's unmatched and, yeah. and, there, and she's very unique in, in so many ways, but mm. Uh, she's been she's been the target of a lot of uh, XJW and JW arrows, and uh, and she survived it. That's probably one of the most tiresome things I think about being involved in activism is that you constantly taking bullets, aren't you? <laughs> if I if I can digress for just not yeah. digress, but yeah. but go off subject here for just a second. 
I think one of the biggest things that's bothering me now that was not really a concern five years ago. And I think it, it began when our relationship began. Was, for me, you were just another fellow XJW, or about to be an XJW, I didn't know what mm -hmm. your status was at the time, mm -hmm. who was just looking for a way to do a survey. Let's yeah. see what everybody really believes. Yeah. And for me, that was a simple thing. I was like, I'll help you. I'll mm -hmm. help the kid out, and and we'll figure out how to how to manage it. So, but what was striking to me was the amount of bullets and venom that that you attracted mm -hmm. by just doing a simple survey. This was before your website. Even. Yeah. Your website was really formed and long just, before the channel. Yeah. yeah just mm -hmm. before. Uh, all it was done, the website was intended to do was just to explain the results of the web, of the survey. Yeah. That was it. And, and it was, you, you might as well have, you know, stood out in the corner, stark naked and yelling obscenities in front of a church for, for the type of reaction that you got. Mm. And, and you certainly didn't deserve that. Mm. And then I got some flack from it too. I, I was threatened two or three times about having my websites taken down mm -hmm. because I was supporting you. Yeah. I mean, bring it on, you know, and a couple of times I temporarily succeeded, but but it, there's a point that that people like yourself have always attracted me. Dick Kelly didn't have a website, but he asked, I suggested it to him, and his website has been up for forever. Mm -hmm. And the XJW site has been up, and it, of course, there's been others as well, but I feel like the web in modern times, websites are the best way to communicate. Yeah. And if you're a good communicator, and I think that you are, then that really gels. If you're not a good communicator, the website's not going to help you. Mm. If you're going to be full of venom and stuff and just use a website to blast the watchtower, blast religion, blast ex-witnesses ex or anybody... If it's filled with hate and venom, you're not going to succeed over time. It'll be, it'll be a flash in the pan for four to six months and then everybody will move on. Why, why do you think it is that some XJWs do have this anger and this bitterness? Well, against the Watchtower, I can, especially if they've gone through break, family breakups and have personally experienced the pain of disfellowshipping and that type of thing. Mm. I can understand that. What is a mystery to me is the number of XJWs who have websites or are trying to put up websites who take a competitive stand against other witnesses. It's like if you're not talking in a voice that they approve, you're some, somehow as bad as the Watchtower is, you're evil, uh, you're an opportunist, uh, that kind of thing. and. I just, I can't relate to any of that. Mm. Everybody should have a voice. And if you don't agree with the voice, well, that's fine. But if we're all kind of pointing in the same direction, then a lot of voices and a lot of attitudes can be acceptable. Yeah. But suddenly there's this thing about, I'm, my website's better than yours, or your website's trash, or you're, you're lying. This, that's the, the newer trend that really, really bothers me. Mm. I, I, I guess I can only put it down to the fact that we're dealing with people who, um, like like ourselves, used to be in a cult, and it, it can be difficult to, to get through that with uh, with your sanity in one piece. Um, and, you know, I, I, I include myself in that, because there's always going to be hang-ups that are left over from your time in, right. in the cult when, right. when you weren't... When everybody had to be friends, everybody had to have the same voice. Any anyone who was di a dissenting voice was causing disunity, right. and so what you end up with is um, a bunch of XJWs who are fine with everyone expressing their opinion, so long as that opinion aligns with theirs. Right. Yes. right. <laughs> Which is yeah. And there's a, mm. a wide variety. There's there are people who will write about their own lives and mention their extra their witness connections, and they'll make their protests that way. 
but it's really not focused on the religion. It's focused on how the damage it did to them personally. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are websites that are set up only to point fingers and criticize other XJW websites. Mm -hmm. I do not so see what the value of, of those are. Mm -hmm. It's like they're almost they're against the watchtower, but they're against anyone that's not far enough against the watchtower yeah. to satisfy them. Yeah, it, it's astonishing. Yeah. Now, I want to just ask you about um, again about um, XJW.com because that was really that was really your editorial vehicle, mm -hmm. and it's safe to say that for a number of years, maybe let's say four or five years, you were writing quite consistently on, on a number of, of important stories that came up right. that were before I got involved. Right. Um, which of those stories kind of touched you most profoundly and which of those stories do you, do you look back on and think, wow, I, I learned a lot about Watchtower from, from that? I, I have to say, believe it or not, the Menlo Park yeah. uh, event, which was, I live in Oregon, Menlo Park is in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. Mm -hmm. I knew no one there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but for some reason I got a very curious email um, that just kind of drew my attention, but it was, it was sent to me. Yeah. It was directed to me. Yeah. I don't know why. But it said, you know, you need to know that this is happening in in the Menlo Park congregation, there's uh, people have been disfellowshipped for no reason, and there's a turmoil and all that. What happened that one of the smaller actors in that story was a was a woman who had transferred from Menlo Park to Santa Rosa. At that particular moment, I happened to be in Santa Rosa because my father-in-law was in near death. Mm -hmm. and we were there taking care of his affairs and taking care, watching him over him before he passed on. So all of a sudden this thing about Menlo Park shows up and this story about the woman involved at Menlo Park in Santa Rosa mm -hmm. caught my eye. And al almost incidentally, there's a knock at the door. I answer the door. And there's an elder, not an elderly man, but I would say a man in his 60s or 70s, um, wearing kind of a tattered blue suit, little seams were stretched a little bit, tie didn't match. And he introduced himself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and he was bringing by the Watchtower magazine. Apparently he had been leaving the Watchtower at my father-in-law's home because they would accept it. Not that my father-in-law would ever read it, but that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So I happened to say, do you know anything about, about what's going on in Menlo Park? And he goes, no. So I mentioned the name of this person. I said, do you know so-and-so? And he goes, yes, I, I think so. Um, do you know the story about her wanting to move from one kingdom hall to another and they don't want a letter? Oh, no, we, we wouldn't do anything like that. I said, well, you're welcome to come back and visit with me again if you can go, if you can bring me any more information. Mm -hmm. So a couple, three days later, the knock at the door, and this little man in his tattered, same tattered blue suit answers, and he said, yes, we have it, but there's some kind of a confusion, and, and someone warned me that you may not be friendly to Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, I'm friendly to Jehovah's Witnesses. I have family who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they told me basically to answer your question and then not come back. I said, okay, well, thank you very much for taking the chance. After that, then suddenly I started getting strange emails out of, out of nowhere and sending me information about Menlo Park. I don't know why, what I did to yeah, do that. But yeah. then the next thing I know, for the, like basically the next uh, two years, I mean, I, I made several personal visits to Menlo Park. I went to the Kingdom Hall. I contacted the elders that mm -hmm. were involved. Um, none of them would talk to me. I even went to their houses, and they wouldn't answer the door. But they, at the same time, they're feeding me information. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it really did. I think the, the, the 
highlight of the Jehovah's Witnesses, what, the, what really revealed the Jehovah's Witnesses, was when they did have a court case, and they and they said, well, "How can the Watchtower do what they're doing to this Kingdom Hall, forcing the people of this Kingdom Hall to change their ways and to change to spend money and whatever?" Uh, doesn't that what the, isn't that what the Catholic Church does? And the head attorney, one of the top ones from New York, said, "The Watchtower is." Is a hierarchy, yeah, and that we got that in black and white for the first time. I think they, they even said when when the order comes down from the Pope to Dean Brock a priest, right? Because that the, the uh, for for viewers who aren't familiar, uh, I actually include the Menlo Park story in my book because mm -hmm. it perfectly highlights the hierarchical nature of the organization. Right. It highlights the fact that the elders are are directly under the control of the organization. They have no autonomy. Right. And it also highlights something very interesting, which Jehovah's Witnesses, as far as I'm aware, just seem to be oblivious to. And that's the fact that Jehovah's Witness congregations do not, in practical terms, own their kingdom hall. Mm -hmm. Because the minute they try to exercise any autonomy, as the Menlo Park elders did, there will be repercussions. Right. And, and for, the, for viewers who don't know what happened with Menlo Park, basically um, a body of elders declined a recommendation to do a refurbishment and they were removed. <laughs> That's essentially what happened. For no other reason than they objected to yeah. the refurbishment. And, and I'm, I, for one, I'm really pleased that you were around and active and engaged at that point because what, what we have as a result is pages and pages of information on xjw.com about the Menlo Park incident if you look at a comparable story, which is the Bonham, Texas right. case from the 1980s, there's very little information about that. And, and, and the circumstances were totally different. Right. It was basically <clears throat> two or three elders who basically wanted to take over the Kingdom Hall and right. change a lot of a lot of the features of that of the body of that Kingdom Hall. Right, right. And, that's, and then when the Watchtower tried to put a stop to that, that's when they said, okay, we'll build a new Kingdom Hall down the road. <laughs> And everybody that wants to goes there, and the other ones can stay here, and you know. But yeah, yeah that was a totally different. It was a it was a doctrinal thing with Brighton, right. wasn't it? Whereas with whereas with Menlo Park, it was literally a case of a circuit obviously saying, um, "I think you should have a refurbishment," and the others saying, "Well, we'll take that on board, but actually we're okay, thank you." And then the circuit obviously saying, "You're all removed." <laughs> and there's a, there's another little side light that I don't. I think I published, mm. maybe, maybe I did, but watch, continue to watch the Menlo Park story mm. because the federal government is expanding the VA hospital, which is technically right across the street from mm. the Kingdom Hall now. And they, they, I think they want to extend that to the freeway and take over the land. I think that's why the Watchtower wanted to get their hands on that ah. property was because the government comes in, they, when that's they condemn, they pay way over, a lot of times way over market, and, and the, what the, that Kingdom Hall is right in the path of the a, a Veterans Hospital. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we don't know whether that's true, but it, it's, it's very plausible that that could well, be. Everything true. basically across the street from the Kingdom Hall has gone to <laughs> VA. Right, I see, I see, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, I, all that remains really is for me to thank you for thank you. all of the work that you've done. Um, again, the, the support that you've given me, um, both as a, a webmaster and as a mentor and as a friend, has just been astonishing. Well, I'll say this. In my life, I have a lot of regrets and a lot of people that I didn't treat as well as I should have. And, and things didn't turn out as well. In your case, you weren't even rel related to me. You didn't even live in the same country as I did. But there was something about you that that said, give this kid a hand. And it turned out to be probably one of the best choices I ever made in my life. Wow. I'm going to have to give you a hug off camera, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your hand. All right, now. thank you. Um, so, John, thanks so much for talking to me and thanks for your hospitality. And uh, as always, if you've enjoyed this video and this interview, there are more, so please don't forget to subscribe. And bye-bye uh, from both of us, and thank you for watching. Take care.